Agile for Humans is brought to you by Audible.com. Get one free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com forward slash Agile. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player, including Scrum, The Art of Doing Twice the Work in Half the Time by Jeff Sutherland, and Crucial Conversations by Carrie Patterson. Visit www.audibletrial.com forward slash agile to enjoy your free audiobook today. Processes and tools dominate today's agile discussions. But we are devoted to the individuals and interactions that make it work. From the beginner to the veteran practitioner, we have something for you. Welcome to Agile for Humans. All right, welcome to this week's episode of Agile for Humans. I'm your host, Ryan Ripley. Joining me tonight, a repeat guest, one of our, our favorite guests, Mr. Don Gray. Tim thought I was going to introduce him first. I've been here once, and I'm already a favorite guest. Yeehaw. Don, you're a legend in the Agile for Humans uh, <laughs> lexicon, especially for your bookshelf. So we're always adding books to the Don Gray bookshelf and, and trying to expand our minds, as, as we think that Don Gray would have us do. Also joining us tonight, and also a repeat guest, and also one of our favorites, Mr. Tim Ottinger. How you doing, sir? We're doing great. And uh, I'm happy to have done my part for the Don Gray Library. It expands weekly. The Agilists, as we like to say, are in, constantly indebted to Amazon, I think. And actually, the latest uh, volley went from Tim to me, The Art of Thought. Tim and I were talking on Tuesday night, and he goes, Don, this is a great book. There's one left on Amazon. If you move fast, you can buy it. So I did. And there's still 13 left. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, for sufficiently large values of one. <laughs> hey, we're just estimating here. It's just a guess, right? That's right. <laughs> well, this episode came together almost serendipitously. We, we were having a discussion on Twitter, Tim and I, about words and how words can perhaps be poisoned, have additional meaning, and even in some cases emotional baggage. And we thought this would be a great topic to to chew through on a podcast. Don Gray came out of left field on a on another tweet and said, hey guys, I'd like to join in. And we're always happy to have Don. I was, ex- I was just ecstatic that he decided to join us. And so the three of us came together and Tim has posed a question. Really, what does enterprise mean? And I'm going to let Tim uh, dive into this into a second. But the, the crux of this, this conversation and I think the question really comes down to is a word more than just a word? And I think Tim can expand on that in a little bit. It's going to be a fun topic. It's one that started on Twitter, moved to a podcast, because, because I think there's just a lot to go through. So, Tim, if you want to take it from there. Well, it's so nice to have more than 140 characters to think in. So the question was about enterprise scaling and what people do to uh, bring their Agile to the enterprise. And we hear people say, oh, yeah, that's great, this Agile stuff, that's fine, but, but this is enterprise level, and, and will it scale? And, of course, the word enterprise has become somehow real in a way that non-enterprise is unreal or doesn't seem to matter. So I thought, hey, you know, since people are talking about it, let me go ask a bunch of people. Now, I'm going to keep this anonymous because I didn't actually ask any of the people if it's okay for me to mention their names and the companies they work for. And you'll see why. So some of the answers were that enterprise essentially means waterfall. I thought, that's interesting. I don't know if it's true, but we'll stay with that. Um, There's a lot of talk about inertia, a lot of talk about you're dealing with more people than you can know personally and trust. You're way beyond that Dunbar number. The ability of people to care about people in other groups, in other departments, at other levels becomes severely limited. So, you know, of course, if you have a, a manager four levels above the developers and he sees, you know, that you could outsource or you could offshore or you could contract out instead and and you'd save money. These aren't people that he knows personally and is concerned about. They're too far away. There's too many of them. Quite often, it's hard to not look for the fungibility of developers in an organization that large. And you don't have enough trust. So, you know, trust and governance are opposites. So where there is no trust, there must be more governance. So those are just some of the ideas that people have given me. Um, And also, 
the understanding that it's bureaucratic processes with many, many approval stages that may take weeks, months, or years to get things that people need. Yeah, that's a it's an interesting list. And, and when you posed the question earlier today, I thought about it for a while. And the first thing that popped into my mind was better, faster, cheaper is what enterprise means. And I, and I don't know if I if that's right or not, but it's the first thing that comes to mind. And I think it hits on many of the, the points and, and some of the other answers that you gave out. If you mix the better, faster, cheaper with that distance between the people making the decisions and the actual developers, and then that outsourcing type of situation happens, and, and that tends to play out poorly. I don't know, Don, when, when you think of enterprise, what, what popped into your mind? Typically, when I think of enterprise, I think of uh, effort at scale. That it's, uh, I think Tim alluded to it, that, uh, or actually mentioned it, there's just more here than you can uh, do. There's more that you can, more people than you can know. Um, and we're trying to do something with all of these people. And I think if I'm guessing correctly, and I am guessing, that we're only talking about the software part of this when we say enterprise. We're not talking about the other organizations and the other departments within the same company that support the software development. Am, am I getting that right, Tim? No, I think it also involves the documentation and testing, whatever else there might be. Well, I was thinking about payroll and uh, f f using a very loaded word, human resources, uh, accounting. You know, I'm, I'm a big fan, as an independent contractor, I'm a big fan of accounts payable. They're some of my favorite people on the world. No, I think that's all included, and HR in particular. When you talk about enterprise, again, you've got people that are making, uh, that have to make rules and have to make considerations and hiring details that are at a distance from the work. And I think maybe that's a defining feature of enterprise is that people have to make decisions far away from where the work is taking place. Making decisions about those doing the work. Well, certainly. Uh, you know the rule of the second floor? Do you know this law? Oh, I, I was going to ask you for an explanation of the Dunbar number for those, oh. for, those, for those in the audience who don't know what that number is. Tim, would you please tell us? Sure. So Dunbar was a researcher, and he had studied primates, and he had wondered why it is that uh, different species, their tribes only reach to a certain size, and then they split in half or in thirds or whatever. Searching for answers, he started correlating everything he could, and eventually he found a correlation between the size of a tribe of a type of primate and the surface area of their brains. So it seems to hold out pretty well. Chimpanzees have larger tribes than spider monkeys, etc. And so by extension, the Dunbar number for a human being should be, now watch me misquote this, I believe it was either 150 or 250. I believe it's 150. 150. So, so probably most human beings can maintain vital relationships living in community with about 150 people, maybe 200 if they have exceptional social brains. Otherwise, um, beyond that, you just can't know everybody anymore. So imagine a Dunbar number of 150 and your organization has 5,000, 8,000, 20,000, 50,000 people. Or the project you're working on has, let's see, 43 teams, figure eight members per team. Uh, I'm over the Dunbar number. Way over the Dunbar number. And that means you have this us-them line, right? You are going to form a tribe. And it's going to be how much of your Dunbar is left over after friends, family, and hobbies. You're going to connect with that many people. And that's where your us-them line is drawn. So that line circles you. But those other people at the other table, those are outside of your in-group. Those are out-group. That's the us-them line. Often, when you're divided functionally, that means the developers are us, the testers are them, or vice versa. The documentalists are us, the developers and testers are them. Or, most damaging, the people doing the work at this level in my team, that's us. Our manager is them. And that leads to the law of the second floor, which is this. Nobody two levels above or below you in the organization really understand what you do for a living. How do we bring this back to an application, Tim? What are we worried about? What are we trying to 
to solve or, or pull apart here? Okay. Well, XP, for example, started with a very, very small team of experts. And they had close communication with their customer. They were able to work you know, very tightly. They worked on cranking up the good to where they could release all the time. They always had code pro- being produced. They moved on. They had a great collaboration. Agile, in all of its forms, at least until recently, has been based on close collaboration with the product owner, with the customer, with the business. Um, now the question is, you know, well, you know, it's not legitimate unless we can scale it. How do we do Agile with 5,000 people? And the fact, I think, is that Agile runs up against these walls. I can't have close communication with 5,000 people. I can have it within my tribe. And now we're back to organizing tribes. Yeah, I think the answer is you don't. And and I actually, with 5,000 people, it's going to be difficult to get the, those interactions that you need in order to keep everyone in sync and aligned without layers of management, without ceremony and hierarchy. It reminds me of of a book I just finished reading recently, The Nature of Software Development by Ron Jeffries, relatively new offering from Ron, where he talks about this very problem, the problem of scaling and trying to, to move past these magic numbers. And what he basically says is, look, for the majority of companies in the world, a few small teams is more than enough. And if they're truly optimized and acting in an agile way, they're going to get a lot of work done and you're probably going to have trouble feeding them sufficient work to keep them busy. Now, in the events where you do have to scale, he discusses the idea of feature teams where teams align around feature sets, even perhaps epics, and they work in such a way that they stay coordinated with the multiple teams, but they're all working on a a defined feature or area. And so that falls back into your, your conversation on tribes. But I think Ron's initial point there was that most companies don't even need to worry about the scale. And if you're working on a project of 5,000 people, perhaps it can be broken down into a smaller one. I think the, there's a, a quote that I'm going to get wrong here, but it's every, every massive project has a, a six-person project begging to get out. And that, that seems to hold true in many of these cases. Well, so there's a, several different um, approaches, right? And the one that we tend to run against that, that bothers us is the idea of scaling up with control and hierarchy, which essentially is scaling by division. So we'll take all the, all the QA people, we'll put them over there, all the developers over here. The architects will be in the corner office away from everybody where they can think and not be bothered by everybody who needs them. We'll, we'll move the POs all to one side of the room and all the developers to the other. So you grow by division and you think, you know, hey, we're going to divide these functional groups so everybody can ply their trade in peace. It doesn't seem to work that way. That seems to be the worst way, but the most obvious. And then you go to the next way along, which is, Arlo Belshi would say, scale out, not up. So instead of growing hi- hierarchy, what you do is you scale out with more separate agile teams with separate work to do, each team right. having everything it needs. And then that goes all the way to the, you know, a further extent of the spectrum into holacracy. It may be that the organization itself needs an entirely different organizational structure to be agile with 20 or 30 teams or more. I think this is where we're going to hit. I don't think a lot of organizations that want to be agile with 5,000 people want to have to go through any of that. No, not at all. And I I think it comes back to the idea, though, that traditionally a company is going to look at scaling up. Right? So they're going to add layers and teams and, and all these, these mechanisms to, to get more people involved. The point that I think Ron made, and I think he was quoting Arlo Belshi, is that teams can scale the amount of work they can do simply by adopting excellent engineering practices like XP. Mm-hmm. So they're leaving productivity on the table than their small number of teams just by not becoming craftsmen. I certainly think that's possible, and there was a lot of the impetus behind the whole take back agile thing is, you know, there's values and practices being left that are really needed while instead um, people are adopting the parts that are more palatable to an organization that's used to running in a more old fashioned way. With that comment, I think back to Diana Larson's agile fluency model. Mm -hmm. So they walk through at the start, we're building code and then there's a focus on value and then we deliver value, which is the two star. And then we optimize value, which is the three star. And then we optimize for systems, which we, which would be the four star. And in my mind, that's where holacracy and some of those other completely game-changing theories come into play. Most companies, I think, are going to play in the one to two star area. 
And so as you think through that, does this massive scaling make sense? Because really we're going to build code and focus on value. And at some point we're going to focus on delivering value. But is it really, is it going to stop there? Because if you look at the agile fluency model, that's where organizational structure shift comes into play to hit to that three star optimized value portion. And that seems to be where the, the resistance comes in. I'm not sure resistance is the right word. I'm not sure that it's actually resistance. I think that there's people who would love to do something. I think the thing is they don't have a good um, set of examples to work from. They don't have a lot of success stories to pull from. I imagine there's a lot of organizations that would love to be three star, but how do you get there from a 1980s uh, org chart? The great man theory. So if you're running on the great man hierarchy, then the ability to change that's pretty tough because you are asking people to uh, abandon the systems in which they become successful and to abandon that that kind of respect and, and uh, admiration and authority. That's hard. I, I think it, it's incredibly hard. It's in fact, it, it requires empathy as as opposed to attacks, which is what we, we see and what Mike Kottmeyer actually pointed out in an interesting article. He He wrote recently name-calling and ad hominem attacks. And it's really about not blaming the manager so much, but really looking at this persistent focus on the end state in the Agile community. But what really, what could be missing and what's keeping people from going from that two to three star that deliver value to optimize value is a lack of understanding of the intermediate patterns. So we understand what organizations look like when they're starting out, typically the the, the large hierarchies, you know, the, the siloed teams, those types of things are well understood. And I think the end state is also has been either theorized very well and in some cases implemented and understood very well. It's the, the three boxes in the middle, those, those in-between areas that tend to get overlooked. And I don't think those patterns are necessarily clear. And it's kind of like what you said, Tim, it's they don't know how to get there. Yeah, Conmeyer's article I thought was spot on. I was in the same place. That was actually a, a talk that I had walked out of for the same reasons that he's describing. Um, I think the wrong place to start any kind of a change is with an accusation. Right. I don't know how we can ever get anywhere if we don't start with a question. His article is based on a talk at Agile Coach Camp 2015. I had actually wandered into the very tail end of it and was confused. <laughs> so it was one of those where I think you needed the full context because it was, as Mike describes, you know, kind of mind blowing that, that the management uh, or the blame management aspect was, was very strong there. But it's, it's an important point, And I agree with you, Tim, that he's spot on that those intermediate patterns, I think, help a lot of these conversations uh, go a lot better. But unfortunately, they're also very difficult to identify. You know, these are things that are difficult to articulate. They're very context sensitive. And so how do you, you know, take the, take the in-between or inter intermediate state of one company and lay it on another and pretend that that's going to be valuable? You can't. So it's really the tools and the insights and the, and the ability to look at the systems and to see where they're at at that moment. I think that's right. I think we put Don to sleep. No, Don's thinking. If somebody's going to get into organizational transitions and, and do this kind of work, they've got to care about the managers. And the default position of we care about the employees and we'd like to save them from their horrible managers, that's got to go. It's a non-starter. Yes. Uh, these, these middle managers are the ones that can totally torpedo any kind of transformation you want to do. So, Don, you, were, you had introduced me to some information on transitions from William Bridges. So, yes, that's from Managing Transitions. Um, it was a, it's a very interesting book, and one of the things it includes is um, a or seven stages of organizational life. And it the stages are dreaming the dream, launching the venture, getting organized, making it, becoming an institution. And then once you become an institution, it can go one of two directions. Uh, the first of which is you close in or you go to the path of renewal. So from, from becoming an institution, you either pick a path of renewal 
which I think some companies are trying to do, hence enterprise transformations, uh, awkward though they may be. And the other one is uh, closing in and then dying. And then the path of renewal takes you back around and sort of swings you through the entire cycle again. Uh, there's a couple of interesting things about this. Is he says, you know, one of the things that's, you, you know when a person dies. It's obvious, it's discreet, but who knows when a company dies? So for those in the, so those who are, have been around a little longer, when I first started in the business, there was a company called DEC, Digital Equipment Corporation. Uh, in my domain, which is manufacturing, they were the heavyweight. When did DEC die? You know, they started spinning down, Compaq bought them. Mm -hmm. Where's Compaq today? Uh, spun off from HP, right? Yeah, so I think they merged with HP for a while, and I have no idea. So, you know, companies and organizations have a less obvious path out of existence than we do. Um, the one thing I really like about it, and I think it speaks to those of us who are in the transform I don't, yeah, transformation business. I'm not... I'm just trying to make the world a little bit better for software development, and that's what I like about the Agile Manifesto. Uh, I'd, I'd like to spend more time on the left-hand side than I do on the right-hand side, but it seems that uh, things like processes uh, and tools are much easier to wrap your brain around and do than people and interactions. Um, and I would guess probably even at scale. Uh, now that I know what the Dunbar number is, I have an idea why. Um, but uh, so he had, goes through the seven laws of organizational development, and the first of which is those who are most those who are most at home with the necessary activities and arrangement of one phase are the ones who are most likely to experience the subsequent phase as a severe personal setback. So. Oh. If you just take this for what it means right now, uh, what we have is people who have become very successful in becoming an institution, and then here come Tim and Don racing madly into the path of renewal going, ah, this is great, you should try this, and they're the ones who have, the, the, the people who helped, helped the company become an institution are the ones who have the most to lose and are going to take it as a personal setback. You wonder why sometimes people aren't all happy about going through organizational change? Hey, you don't need to do this micromanaging that got you successful. And, and so this is the two, back, I think back to Tim's two floors uh, point is that the people who are two floors up have become successful in a very different paradigm than the one that I'm very actively promoting. I'm a threat to their worldview. Uh, now that that's that's a generic statement. You know, all all what is it? All something statements are false. Even all generalizations are false. Even this one. Yes. So <laughs> uh, I've had the chance to work with some very wonderful people. But I've also worked with some people who, as soon as one person was gone, it was back to business as usual. The sponsor, whoever it was that was trying to hold a change in place, moved on, and that change was gone instantly. Now, there's another saying, what goes around comes around if you stick around long enough. <laughs> so... I, I, I operate, large, well, I operate all over the world, but spend a lot of my time in the southeast, and I'm currently working in Atlanta, where I worked back in the 2010 time frame. So I hooked up with some of my friends from the 2010 time frame, had supper, I guess it was about a month ago. And so I was there as part of them going agile. They went through a buyout, funding was cut, agile was off the blocks. And they went back to business as usual. Five years later, 
they're now going through Agile again. They're going to be Agile again. So uh, it's, it's, it's interesting that I th think in some ways we are starting to get some traction and mind share. Uh, but there's still a lot of people who have two floors up who have become very successful and uh, don't understand or have not made the shift in thinking that provides a foothold for change to happen. The second law of organizational development, the success will come out of any phase of organizational development, the successful, I'm sorry, the successful outcome of any phase of organizational development triggers its demise by creating the challenges that it is not equipped to handle. So that says as we become successful at launching the venture, we are creating the very things, the very conditions and challenges that we can't handle. And so um, I have a friend who I've worked with and is now off starting his Agile company. It's a product company. He's going to hit this. Uh, he's a great guy, wonderful person, smart, proficient coder, and sooner or later he's going to be in the people business. And he's probably not going to do really well because he enjoys coding. He'd rather code than uh, manage people problems. So anyway, there's, there's two or three more of these. Uh, it's a great book, Managing Transitions by William Bridges. Uh, Lee Copeland was actually the gentleman, uh, SQE, who pointed it out to me. Uh, recommended highly. I think that second law, Don, I think that's the interesting one, and it ties back to, to part of our other conversation. It, that's the space where the patterns aren't clear. So that's the space where we're, we're making a change, or we're making a... a We've come out of a phase successfully, but it's also going to crumble because that phase is no longer, the, the lessons learned from that phase are no longer applicable to the next one. And coaching people through that, I think, can be incredibly tricky. You know, I, I'm sure you've seen this, this pattern before where you know, what made them successful, what got them through a particular phase is no longer good, but they hold on to it. They, and I think the next even law that you brought up, the third law is you know, the thing that the organization... Um, needs to let go, but that, I'm sorry, in a, any significant transformation, the thing that the organization needs to let go of is the very thing that got it this far. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the, that's the linchpin to getting even management, developers, all of these groups on board with the transition or the transformation is convincing them, or at least demonstrating to them that there's value in letting go of the things that they know uh, to be right and good. You know, that's, I think we saw that short because I think it's not about organizations. I think it's about human beings. Um, sure. Think about the, uh, the, the guy who's been dating and now he's getting married. He probably wants to give up his dating behaviors towards other women. Um, <laughs> take a look at the kid who goes from high school to college or college to work life. Um, take a look at, uh, you know, um, no children to children we have a lot of these transitions where we really have to change. We can't be irresponsible high school students. We've got to take care of ourselves in college. I can't be a college student. I have work and, and rent and I have to pay for my stuff. And, um, you know, so there's, so there's a lot of that. I think it's a lot of transitions. I think it's a general purpose rule. You know, Tim, with those analogies that you give though, they, there's an inciting incident or an inciting event it's going to cause the realization of the behavior that needs to change. In the case of a guy or a gal getting married, their spouse is going to tell them that their, their old dating behaviors are unacceptable. Or when it's a, a high school student going to college, there's usually a parent involved in, in, making the, in noting the need to make those switches. When it comes back to an organization, who's there to actually point out, hey, this behavior is no longer going to get us to where we need to go? And I think that's the that's the nut to crack in this whole conversation is that without – so let me put it this way. When I've seen companies open to experimentation, and I think when what, what a lot of the literature supports is that companies in trouble experiment very quickly and rapidly because they have nothing else to lose. And so when I've seen agile transformations go incredibly well or an agile project as a pilot or as just an experiment go very well is when something has to happen, it's failed multiple times – and hey, there's nothing to lose at this point because it, 
if it doesn't happen, it, it wouldn't be any different than before. Short of that, what's what's the inciting incident that starts this hero-like journey from, you know, the current the current situation of, of where an organization or even a person is at to this renewal? So I'll let Don give an answer, but but just to let you know, I have a sampling problem here again. Uh, by the time somebody calls me in, they've decided that. Uh, this is something that they want to try or, or a change they need to make. Um, so I tend to meet people who are already there. Um, I think that there is an inherent enterprise assumption that permission is controlled by some central authority. And you have to have permission to make any changes or to uh, to grow in a new direction or to try something different. You know, think about uh, all the developers who are terrified that somebody's going to come by and see them uh, sit in a group of four people talking about the software instead of typing. So they don't pair, they don't mob. People who are terrified that they're going to, you know, be caught wasting time on testing when they should be coding. Permission to do good things tends to be held somewhere else. And people have a almost a rational fear of having that permission withheld or being caught in excess of their permission. So, but I'm lucky. Like I said, by the time I'm called, there's an awareness that there's a change necessary. They may not get the full extent of how much change it is, but there you go. I said I was going to let Don answer that, and then I did it. So, Don? <laughs> you, you, and thank you so much, Tim. Anything else I can help you answer? <laughs> so, like Tim, I typically get involved uh, when somebody's made the decision that a change should be made. Uh, what, they, what often isn't understood is that change is different for different people. I've written several blog posts about this, and um, I really don't want to get into all of those. So let me just go back. Once again, going back to managing transitions, um, my, some of my first notes from the book says, it isn't the changes that do you in. It's the transitions. They aren't the same thing. Change is situational, the move to a new site. Transition, on the other hand, is psychological. It is a three-phase process that people go through as they internalize and come to terms, terms with the details of the new situation that the change brings about. So changing from phase-gated long-term delivery to scrum with two week iterations is very quick you know bam we can do that it's the transition and the behaviors that have to mo be modified and the understandings and the practices and the uh, capability skills that have to shift that create issues um, furthermore uh, Tim didn't say this uh, but since I said he and I often come in at the same time, which is after somebody, usually two floors up, says, hey, we need to do Agile, they're generally not the people who are going through most of the transition. It's the people that Tim and I work with uh, that are largely doing the actual change. The managers are trying to, well, we'll just do everything the same at the manager level, at the two floor up level, but it's the developers that are going to do the changing. Um, I think there's a quote that says, everybody likes change when somebody else is doing it. And, and my very favorite one of those is, if everybody else would do what I say, my life would be a lot easier. <laughs> right. So, anyway, uh, I keep... So there, there's, we're going to have to throw one other book in the change uh, on Don's bookshelf in just a second. But the three phases that are identified in uh, managing transitions is the ending, the neutral zone, and the new beginning. And so those are sort of the three major portions that you should be thinking about as you decide there should be a change either in your life or in the people who report to you and how they should do work. Um, 
Then the other book I'm going to throw on the bookshelf is, I have it as Quality Software Management Volume 4, Anticipating Change by Jerry Weinberg. Uh, fantastic book dealing with the subject of organizational and personal change. Uh, it's now available as two ebooks, uh, I believe, available via... I think he's on LeanPub, LeanPub, right? thank you. I was going to say LinkedIn, and I knew that wasn't right. Yeah, so Jerry Weinberg, if for those of you out there not aware, a uh, prolific author on systems thinking, software testing. I think he even has a new uh, Agile-centric book out on LeanPub, or at least in beta format. A lot of great deals on his books out there right now. I don't. I personally do not think you you could read enough Jerry Weinberg. Yeah, th- these are books that you need to get in your brain and internalize and and then turn around and use that knowledge in your in your organizations. It's They're all just excellent. We started with this with um, what does it mean to be enterprise and, and what is the hurdle with it? I think we're at a good point for the question. You know, what, what would it mean when an organization wants to be agile? Now, this is a decision, like I said, made by... It may not be the people who are changing that are making it. Maybe one of the difference with original XP is it was the people doing the work who wanted to do it differently... And, and this is sometimes pushed down. But what would an agile organization mean? And I've also asked this question. And um, some people gave me what I would like to consider the right answer, that is their ability to make change uh, in their plans. Uh, I'm not sure that that's actually the, the meaning most people put to it. Uh, I think a lot of organizations, when they're asking for agility, really they don't want the ability to abandon their plans and modify their plans. Usually these organizations that run on... Uh, long-term and short-term and mid-term roadmaps and strong promises. And if what we delivered was different from what they promised, they would consider it a failure, not a, an agile success. And I think that um, maybe people selling agile quite often are a little caught up in, hey, look at our uptick in adoption numbers and look how many more clients we have. And, you know, God bless them. Look how much more money we're making. Good. They should. I hope they do. But in that, is there a real transformation in that idea? Do people have any idea what they're buying when they buy agility? Because a lot of organizations think that it means that um, we'll follow our roadmap and we won't deviate from it and we'll get stuff done faster. And I'm not sure that that's agile. Agile was never faster. It was only ever sooner. So I've seen some, some really good work out there by Dan Greening. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with his agile base patterns. So he's identified uh, five key patterns that an organization uh, should implement in order to become agile or to resemble an agile organization. And he starts with measuring economic progress. And so really understanding, uh, measuring value in the form of what's appropriate for that organization in the right context into it, about what's meaningful for them. And then adaptively experimenting for improvement. Uh, followed by limiting work in progress, embracing collective responsibility, and the ability to solve systemic problems. And he's put out quite a bit of material around the idea that if those five patterns are in place within an organization, the likelihood of them being agile goes up. It seems like with those five patterns, you could respond to change and be very good at it, which would get back to, I think, the right answer for... Uh, agility at an, at a at scale within an organization, and we'll put a link to the show no, in the show notes to Dan's work on the agile base patterns. If you're interested in seeing uh, how he fleshes those out, but it's some pretty interesting stuff about weaving the philosophy of agile into an organization in an actionable way. Hmm. So I, I found that very intriguing. Well, thank you for that. I, I'm definitely going to dig into that. Um, but it does kind of open up two interesting ideas that the problem with maybe enterprise agile adoption is that we can't decide for sure what enterprise or agile mean. Well, and you said adoption, not transformation. Mm-hmm. And, That's and, true. And so uh, a few months ago, I was flipping through a uh, old notebook and I came across a note getting back to Jerry Weinberg. And it said, three nouns in a row equals trouble. (laughs) (laughs) 
I'm going three nouns in a row equals trouble. So if I if my title is Senior Enterprise Agile Transformation Coach, what does that say? Trouble. It's and, and so I said, you know, I so I actually emailed him with Jerry. I, I found this and so uh, Jerry has a lot of different rules of three. Mm-hmm. Okay, we're going to vector off to the side for a minute, then I'll come back. Uh, you know, if you can't think of three three ways to solve a problem, you haven't thought about the problem enough. Okay, here's even worse, more more uh, interesting is, if you can't think of three ways your prob- the, your solution to the problem will create more problems, you haven't thought about your solution enough. And so there's a couple more of those, I won't go into them right now. So I, he has this thing with three, so I said, well, Jerry, tell me more about this rule of, you know, three nouns. And I'm going, he says, Don, if somebody, if you string three nouns in a row, you have not thought enough about what is actually happening, the value, and the activities involved. So I think of that every time I hear an enterprise transformation coach. <laughs> You know, exactly what does that mean other than, you know, I have to wonder. If there's a lot of activity that backs that up, then maybe that's a valid thing. But is there, you know, I, I think some of we, I think we're getting busy into branding sometimes and avoiding the doing. We're trying to differentiate by um, nouns and not by activity. But I think getting back to what does agile and what does enterprise mean, Agile is such a loaded and poisoned word at this point. It's very difficult to pin down a definition. I typically go with its four values and 12 principles. And then whatever practices or decisions you're making should should be in alignment with those four values and 12 principles. And that to me is is the guiding light for what it, what agile should mean or could mean. Could mean is probably the right the better way to put it. Others would say it's it's the ability to respond to change. You know, others say agility is um, is doing things faster, but speed and agility are actually in conflict. Yes, from a definition standpoint. Um, so it's a very difficult question to answer. In my mind, enterprise agility means that an enterprise has embraced the manifesto and has decided that their their uh, their utmost priority is the delivery of valuable software continuously but that they also promote healthy and safe environments to do so. And that's expressed through sustainable pace, right? So it's, it's not only is it delivery, but it's a value on people. And then those things measuring back to the, the four values. Does the organization value inter- individuals and interactions, right? Are they, are they seeking ways to collaboratively attack problems and to find solutions and to, to do all of those things, or are they putting process on top of people in order to come up with a check the box type of solution to issues? You know, that's how I, I typically look at it, but I know there's a thousand different answers to this question. Well, let's, let's not get past that too fast, right? So let's take another look um, at the manifesto for just a second, right? Um, how do you build? Well, we, can't go, we, we can't go too fast because we have to follow Jerry's rule. That's only one answer. Okay. So we need three. <laughs> Um, think about individuals and interactions among 3,000 people that you don't know very well. Sure. This is going to be hard to manage. This is going to be hard to, to understand, and it's going to be hard to work with. Um, how about not having comprehensive documentation when some of the people that you work with, you don't even know them. You've never met them, right? They're, they're building some piece of a thing for you somewhere, and you can't even talk to them. or They're in a different time zone. So you're... Um, um, your Budapest team and your um, Houston team are not communicating very well. Well, duh. Right? Um, customer collaboration over contract negotiation. Well, let's bring the customer, put him in front of all 8,000 people. That would be great. You know? <laughs> um, and then, of course, what happens when you have 300 interdependent teams and somebody decides to respond to change instead of follow the architecture that they're all sharing? Sure. I think that there are some natural pressures against agility when the numbers go outside of the range of people in your Dunbar group. 
Yeah, and that goes back to a, a comment that I made earlier that perhaps agility does not apl- does not apply to the enterprise, and that perhaps the idea that the most efficient and effective method of conveying information to and within a development team is face to face communication, perhaps that's a leap too far when you have a thousand developers working on a project, because it's clearly impossible, right? You cannot you cannot have that high velocity information transfer of face-to-face communication among a thousand developers and, and have that be sustainable. Well, this really smart guy named Don and, and uh, <laughs> this really smart lady named Esther, not too long ago, were teaching me to think in containers, right? So you get to a stage where you can't deal with 8,000 individuals, but you might be able to deal with some number of teams. One of the managers I worked with, I coached him for a while. He had uh, five teams of 10 people each. He had 50 individuals that he was dealing with individually with their work assignments and their de- percentage completion and their due dates and their own human resources, annual reviews, and blah, 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 blah. And frankly, the guy was miserable. He was so unhappy. There was no way to do a good job at what he was doing. Eventually, we glommed onto the idea about just treat the teams atomically. So you have right. five people you're dealing with. Each one is a compound person, but okay, it's five people. And just deal with them. When we actually put that into practice and figured out what that meant, and so they had five autonomous teams communicating, it was a meeting among six people, essentially, and it was relatively easy. And his step was lighter, and his smile was bigger, and he's more pleasant and easier to work with, and, and they all loved him. Um, they weren't too keen on him at first. But after this transformation, he was doing pretty well. So there's containers, right? And at some point, you have to start looking at a different structure than 8,000 individuals. You don't have 300 team members. You have a small number of teams on one product, a small number of teams on another product, and a liaison between them. And I know that starts to sound like holacracy. I know it starts to sound like sociocracy. I'm sure that somebody's going to say that it's a communist conspiracy. But it is about... How do the tribes interact? You know, we've had entire nations in our world's history where um, when you could change towns, you change languages, but they traded and they all had a certain level of prosperity and everybody had something that someone else needed. Uh, And these places were fine until they were, you know, taken over by foreigners and forced into a new language. They standardized him, standardized. That's right. They were improved and standardized Um, because, you know, uniformity is what we really need Um, because uniformity is easier to deal with. At well, a and, that, level, that, from a distance. And, that, and that gives us fungible programmers. Right. All good things. Yeah, right. And, <laughs> and of course, you'd want them to be fungible if your problem is you have to keep rebalancing things. This group's behind, that group's ahead. Well, pull some people out, move them over. I, I have some sympathy here for the managers who are trying to legitimately achieve some kind of, um, of an agility in the organization. And frankly, the numbers they're working with make it very, very hard to do so. And there has to be some kind of distributed decision-making and some distributed permission. And you have to give people below you the permission to give permission and not you know, cut them short by going around them and, and re-correcting their people from doing what they were told they could do. It's hard. It's tough. So I, I'm not on your guys' side of the fence. I'm an internal em- employee with a company. Uh, so I'm wondering... When you guys see these these large organizations and these type of structures, is it raised as an impediment that they have so many people involved and that these containers need to be put in place? And how is that received? <laughs> Do you want to start, Don? <laughs> uh, are these is the number of yes and no? I or I could give the consultant's answer. It all depends. Um, Thank you. That's Don Gray, ladies and gentlemen. He'll uh, he'll be on next week's episode as well. <laughs> what top? What topic am I not talking about next week? I think next week is uh, change. Ah, I might have some ideas about that. The, it's interesting that even um, I don't know. Fred Brooks wrote the Mythical Man Month thirty years ago now, something like that which led to Brooks Law, which is uh, adding people to a late project makes it later. I still experience uh, organizations responding as they usually would 
or historically would, by adding new teams to deliver new features. And I think Tim said something, Tim and you also, Ryan, said something earlier about if we can improve the functioning of the team, we leave less work on the table. Mm -hmm. Right. And by reducing the number of teams, you reduce the communication overhead. You reduce the interpersonal friction or, or um, so need for social lubrication. And I'm a big fan of meeting people and having lunch and whatnot, but it takes time. It's back to the Dunbar number thing. There's just so much I can do. I'm working in an organization now that has over 40 teams on this project. I'm, I'm working through the teams two at a time, maybe three. It's the slowest possible way to create change. So some people haven't quite learned yet that there's other ways to configure and uh, sh configure work, distribute work, feed work into work units, which in my case would be teams. And by doing that in a better way, we can reduce the number of teams necessary and then find a way to, as, as Tim talked about, create containers of teams in such a way that uh, all 40-some-odd teams don't have to work together closely, but there might be three or four that should work together closely here. Um, if you will, think of it as a constellation. Uh, these things are grouped together because they're similar and they should be uh, together. Other teams working on other parts of the code base, other parts of the uh, functionality, are in a different constellation. There has to be sharing, though, so that when the two constellation com constellations come together, the teams that, when, when they come together, they have to have cross-membership so that the, both teams are responsible for any issues that arise between their code base. So I, I've seen this work at a small level, right? So I am... Uh, I'm in management. I have a, a team of ten, and and I've split them, so I can't I can't deep dive the lives of the work lives of ten people every single day, right? So I actually have two two teams that I deal with in a in a feature type setup, and it works incredibly well. And there are times where there are collisions. There are times where there's all hands on deck moments where that has to be managed. But for the most part, these containers save my sanity, right? So they, they you make it sanity? so I, I, I have traces of it done. Okay. Trace. Sorry. It, it, it makes it emerge a little more often, the, the sane moments. But, um, but yeah, these containers actually do give me the ability to, to, to look at the teams, at these two different groups holistically, the ability to, to see how they're working together, to look at the systems and packing them, impacting them. I can actually focus on some of those things other than worrying about the day-to-day -day activities of each individual member. And I'm finding that pulling myself up from that level, applying trust to these containers, and seeing just beautiful outcomes more often than not has freed me up to do more interesting work. And so from a smaller scale, this has actually played out very well for me. I've not seen it larger, though. Isn't that interesting that you see that there's more than I can control and be personally involved in? So my alternative is to give alignment and permission and trust. Right. And isn't that kind of cool? I think very empowering. I think that's the seeds of where agile enterprises will go. And I want to give another piece with this. I've worked with these great companies. Some of the they some of them are the biggest companies on the planet. And a lot of these companies have people um, that they've worked great effort to hire. Really awesome developers, people of great reputation, people of, of a lot of talent. They've got managers and developers who've been with the company 10, 20, 30 years. And they've got people who've risen through the ranks on merit. They have made good decisions in the past. They've been reliable. They have been you know, there with answers when answers were needed. And on this merit, they've risen up through the ranks somewhat, right? And you know, a large organization that's been around for a lot of years, the top doesn't turn over fast enough to 
rocket people to the top. It's a rarefied air up there. But there's a lot of people who deserve to be there. And to walk in and say, you know what, you should fire half of your people. Uh, you have two different kinds of organizational members now. Some of the people are going, oh, my God, no, all these people deserve to be here. We've worked so hard to get them here and to train them. Please don't say that. And the other half is like, sure, tell me who to fire. I'll get rid of all of them. Right. And, and I don't want that second one. I don't want to be you know, that person. I'm there to help everybody. And they deserve to be there. I think what's clear is they probably don't need to hire more people. They probably right. need – they don't – it's not like there's a shortage of work or an overage of work and half of them are watching cartoons. You know, everybody's really busy and they need more done. So that's why they want to bring more people in. So it's usually not a situation where you walk in and say, you know what, you shouldn't have 300 developers. You should have 12. Fire all the rest of them. Uh, well, that would also be a, a career suicide for me, wouldn't it? <laughs> Can you imagine who's going to hire me ever again? Yeah, I would never do that anyway. And like I said, they deserve to be there. So the question is, how can we help an organization to give alignment, autonomy, and trust instead of trying to get tighter control? And how do you do that when they're people you don't know? And I think that's really when we come in to do enterprise scale agile, we should stop talking about org charts and structures and layering we should be talking about containers and trust and alignment. My theory. It may be a little Pollyanna, but it's mine. So we have hit our time box, better known as Don Gray's bedtime. <laughs> and so, Tim, really appreciate you joining us again on Agile for Humans. Love having you on the show. Is there anything that you'd like to plug? Anything that, the, that you think the listeners would, that they should run out and read? Or anything else that you'd like to bring to their attention before we wrap up for tonight? Well, it's been a really good couple of months on the Industrial Logic blog. I do recommend people pop over, take a look. Um, there's a lot of advice there now that's good for everybody, whether you're a huge enterprise or something smaller. And a lot of the blogs are covering the kind of problems we see as we enter into these large enterprises. So highly recommend popping over to Industrial Logic, taking a look at the blogs and the workshops that we offer. Thanks, Tim. Don, anything that we can promote for you? So, a couple of things. Uh, first, uh, minor point is there's a, I, I put a link in the chat window about the future of organizations. Uh, and it's an article that looks at the physical structure. The advantage of hierarchies is it allows a small number of people to pivot a large number of people very quickly and point them in a new direction. That works well as long as uh, the people at the top aren't two levels removed from what's going on, which by definition they are, but that's probably another podcast. Uh, so this article looks at a uh, way of other possible organizational structures, and it does include tribes, but it, it does hit that Dunbar number. They said 150, they didn't say a Dunbar number, but now I know the two are equal. The other, the, the major plug is coaching beyond the team, influencing the organization. Esther Derby and I are uh, leading that workshop October 19th and 20th in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And we're looking forward to having a great time there and sharing some ideas about entering organizations, creating rapport, understanding how influence flows through the organization, and in different ways of showing information and data in, a, in, in graphical format that allow people to grasp it quicker and easier. Sounds like very topical, especially given the, the conversation we just had. So. Are you guys sold out, Don? Do you still have seats available? Uh, there are still seats available. Uh, and if somebody listening to this sends me an email, uh, I can probably get them a friend and family rate. That sounds great. So anyone interested, we'll, we'll have links and contact information for Don in the show notes. It's, um, it's Don Gray and Esther Derby talking about coaching beyond the team. I've only heard great things about it. Someday I hope to make it out there, Don. It's not that far. You're in the Midwest. It's in the Midwest. <laughs> yeah. It's just a quick flight, right? You should be able to drive it. Indiana to Minnesota? You're young. That's 10 hours. I've done it. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, um, if any of our listeners are in 
Poland, um, I'll be closing out at uh, Warsaw's um, Agile by Example this year. Oh, that's great. So you're closing keynote out there, yeah. huh? Oh, that's congratulations. That's great. Should be a lot of fun. Well, all right, guys. That's another episode of Agile for Humans. Thank you for joining us and have a great night. Thanks for listening to Agile for Humans. Let's keep the conversation going. Drop us a question on Twitter at Agile for Humans or visit agileforhumans.com. Oh, no, I just got self-organized again. <laughs>